Good evening, this is What's Going On. I'm John Lee. Our guest this evening is Kevin Blue, the new athletics director at UC Davis. Kevin, I want to thank you for being on our show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. My yeah. pleasure. Yeah. My pleasure. So, um, would you say you're a jock? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if that word really describes very many uh, of us that you know, have played college sports, but, uh, you know, I, I, I'm an avid sports watcher, sports fan, uh, sports participant, but I think the word jock is a little, uh, maybe a little passe. Well, the, I think the theme tonight is to talk about student athletics. Correct. So um, the first word student is what is one of the things that distinguishes UC Davis is we put the word student first yeah. and always have. So um, first, let's talk about what you were like when you were a little kid. How much did you play sports? How much did you do school? What, what were you like as a kid growing up? Yeah, it was, uh, I, I played a lot of sports. I grew up in Toronto, Canada where I played uh, hockey like most young Canadian people do and uh, in the winters. Uh, I played golf in the summertime, uh, baseball in the summertime, a little bit of basketball here and there. Uh, but my family it was, a, it was a really big sports family and you know, I, I've, I've loved competing since I was you know, really small and, uh, and that's sort of carried me through my, my career. And I st we still get to co the good thing about my job is you still get to compete uh, even though you're not playing. Well, there are a lot of levels of indication of whether or not you're doing better, whether or not you're at the top of your game. We're going to get into some of those yeah. indicators as we go on. So um, did you play sports in high school? I did. So I, I, was, uh, I played hockey uh, all the way up through graduating in, in Toronto. You have all your and teeth. I do. Yeah, we wore face masks. Uh, in, in Toronto, but the yeah no I enjoyed that. It's a big part of the the fabric of the culture of Canada is that sport. Absolutely. And, um, you know I miss it a little bit being down here, but uh, I, you know I get to look back on on my childhood fondly with, with memories of hockey. So I played hockey through high school. I uh, also ran a little cross country, played some junior varsity basketball, and then focused my you know I played golf in college, so golf was a big part of my life. Uh, throughout high school, but you know during the winter it, it wasn't. So I was I was play with the out. black ball. Yeah, no, An it's orange too, too cold, too much ice, too much snow. It was good to get some time off. You know, you 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 practice a lot and you work really hard in the spring, uh, summer, and fall, and the winter was a good time to rejuvenate a little bit. And uh, I think that you know I think golfers from up north. Have, a, have an ability not to get burned out because they're, you know, they're able to take that time and, and do something else. I'm not going to talk about what I know about golf because it's very limited. Um, so you went to college on a golf scholarship. I did. I graduated from high school in 2001, and I Went to Stanford to play golf, which was a great honor, and it was something that I dreamed about when I was when I was young. The you know Tiger Woods ha had a big influence on us. When, yeah, when he we did kids. play golf there. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was something that you know I, I was really proud of that proud of that opportunity and really enjoyed it. And I was I was you know ironically actually the first time I went to college, I was on a plane on September eleventh two thousand one. Uh, ready to take off and go and go to college for the first time uh, from Toronto to San Francisco. And it was actually 9 o'clock in the morning when, when all the things, the unfortunate uh, incidents happened in New York. And they told us to go home and take our take, go get our bags, go no home. No planes for the next four no, or five days. It was, it was a long time. I didn't get down for a little while. So that was an interesting, uh, obviously it was a tragic thing that happened and it was just interesting to sort of be a part of Air travel on that day, uh, but I yeah so I, I eventually made it down there and had a great four years. Graduated in two thousand five and you know moved my way through grad school and some jobs and here I am. Well, we want to go through some of those jobs, but let's go through grad school first. You're, um, I mean, let's talk about undergraduate. What half of what we're talking about is the balance between being a student and being an athlete. 
How did you do that? How did that work for you yeah. as an undergraduate? It's a good question. I think uh, a lot of people don't realize if you're not for, if they're not familiar with how student athletes are, they don't have, they don't realize the passion that that a lot of student athletes have not only for their sport but also to to do well in school. And I just had the mindset that I wanted to compete at everything I did, including uh, my academics. And you know, Stanford is a school that is demanding, just like UC Davis, and the level of competition you know, in golf is very high as well. So it was just, you know, I think a lot of us, when we get in those environments, we just thrive being tested and pushed and, and the opportunities that we have are, are extraordinary. So I, I just felt fortunate to be there and worked as hard as I could. And, you know, it's challenging, but at the end of the day, you get to do what you love and compete while also getting a fantastic education. There's not too much wrong with that. And, you know, that's the type of perspective that we like to develop in our student athletes here as well. So I'm going to subtly bring in my first set of statistics here. In this morning's B, it reported that the last cohort of students that entered UCD and other schools in 2009-2010 are now in a cohort six years later where they're measured for graduation. And Davis had a fairly spectacular I want to say 87% of the entering freshman athletes graduated in four years. Yes, and, and that's something that, you know, we're, we're proud of that. We, uh, we'd like to see that number continue to grow. And that is, that is part of the, uh, of the expectation when, you know, as far as how we're running our athletics program. We, we expect that academic performance to be high. You know, we're, we're fortunate enough to lead the Big West Conference, I think, for the fifth year in a row. Um, and in football, we've, we've been fortunate enough to lead the Big Sky Conference for, I think, three years in a row now, maybe four. So that's, you know, we're proud of that. That's a big part of what we're trying to do. The, the additional statistic is, compared to the entire student body at UCD, it's only 2% less. It, it, yeah, I, I haven't seen, I've seen stats that indicate it to be equivalent. As a well, fact. it's depends statistically on you, equivalent yeah. as far as I'm concerned. That's my point. Yeah. Is that somebody that devotes 20, 30 hours a week to their athletic performance on top of being a full-time student. Correct. Somehow has to do time management and focus their energy so much that when they're in the classroom, when they're in the home studying, they're putting the same focus as they are when they're in the weight room or when they're in the field or when they're on the court performing. Yeah, and I think being tested and pushed that way is really uh, conducive to developing the type of habits that are going to carry you forward through the rest of your life when you have other competing priorities, whether it be work, family, other interests, et cetera. So I think that it's uh, the, the ability to be a student athlete in a demanding environment while it is the hard road in many ways in the short term, it does strengthen uh, our young people to be able to develop the, the type of toughness and the type of perspective and the type of grit and the type of emotional intelligence that's required to be successful down the road. And what we are increasingly trying to do is um, be, be intentional about how we're developing those characteristics. And uh, I think that's really important. It's really important for people to understand that. You know, there's, there's 8 million uh, high school students who play varsity sports in the United States and in the state of California is 750,000 or so. Um, so it's the, 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 the idea of balancing school and sports is, uh, is not confined to a small niche of people. It's a quite a broad uh, cultural phenomenon in, in the United States. And you know, to the extent that there's schools like Davis that can demonstrate um, to all the young people out there that yes, in fact, you can do both at a high level and you know it's cool to try to do both at a high level. I think those are really that's a really important message. I agree. So, in two thousand one, you started as a freshman, and now, sixteen, fifteen years later, you're the athletic director. You're thirty three. You're very young for somebody at your level in your position, at a Division one AA school. Um, you made one uh, side road where you went to grad school. Why did you decide to go to grad school and what did you study? That's a good question. So when I was playing golf, I was fascinated with the psychology of high performance and sports psychology. 
and I wanted to learn as much as I could about that. So I did. I went to I did a PhD in sports psychology at uh, Michigan State University's Graduate School of Education, and I was fortunate to study under one of the foremost academic sports psychologists in the United States, named uh, Dr. Dan Gould, and he he remains a mentor of mine. And uh, I really learned a lot. I, my original goal was to be a sports psychology coach on the PGA Tour. And I was lucky enough to be able to do some coaching at a very high level while I was in grad school. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed that, but I, I also realized that the intellectual challenge of it was was something that I don't know if it would be sustaining for a 40-year career. And, I, you know, I wanted to try my hand on the business side of sports and in a situ in situations where there's a bit more diversity in terms of the intellectual challenge and that's what the athletic director job is right there's a lot of there's a lot there there's a there's a diversity of you know there's a di diversity of requirements that it takes versatility to be to be proficient at you know I, on a regular basis I will interact with our student athletes you know our undergraduate students uh, our staff, our coaches, our supporters, and our donors, uh, our faculty, you know, our, our central uh, administration as well. So there, the, the number of um, so-called languages that you need to speak is, is pretty extensive. And that's, just, that's a really fun part of my job. Well, it's integral. It's imperative that yeah. you be able to be a social animal and can talk those different languages to those different groups of people and translate yeah. between each other. I love to say that the Pomo Miwok, Native American Indian of this land, the word for farmer is person who does a thousand things. Wow. Didn't know and that. well that's Thank you for that's my that. contribution. Yeah. I mean that that's one way of translating Aggie. Wow. I mean, what, what a farmer does every day is gets up in the morning and makes a long list of things to do and then tries to get as many of them done as possible. Yeah. I mean, that's what you do every day. And that's what Aggie Land is about. Yeah. Um, so what would you do your PhD dissertation on? Yeah. Uh, the topic was about uh, a construct in sports psychology called sports intelligence. And it's essentially like tactical intelligence and how you learn. And I use the, 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 uh, the arena of golf, the, the okay. context of golf. So the question that I was trying to understand was how do you learn how to play smart, right? So some people have really good technical skills and they're strong and can hit the ball far. And then other people, you know, what the Bubba same, Watson. same set. Yeah, well, Bubba Bubba. Watts is highly intelligent <laughs> from, a, from, a, from a golf IQ standpoint. But... But the point is, like, how? What are the components of learning how to play um, s smart, and how does that process work? And you know, I ended up, I guess, concluding or I guess, you know, proposing that there's there's a set of psychological skills that are enable golfers to understand how to practice and how to improve, and then there's a another set of skills that allow golfers to understand how to compete and how to perform. And those two things are somewhat different from each other. Um, right hand and left hand. Yeah, well, I think that... I don't believe in right brain and left yeah, brain. I think there's some correlation between the two, but I think that, uh, you know, the, we, we called it developmental intelligence. And I think that that is a, a, a... It's an important thing for athletes, right? Some athletes understand the path that they need to go down to really improve. They understand how to identify their weaknesses and then how to seek help or train themselves to eliminate those weaknesses. Uh, and some athletes are really able to persist and, and work hard and, 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 and move towards improvements. So there's a, whole, there's a set of psychological skills that's correlated with an ability to improve. Of course, talent matters, but all else equal from a talent standpoint, whoever understands the process, process of improvement and understands how to commit to it and understands how to involve other people to help them, that, that person is going to improve faster, right? So it was, that was the topic of it. I didn't, I, it wasn't a, I don't think it was a very, very good uh, dissertation. It was interesting, but I just think that it wasn't necessarily, a, you know, an empirical study or anything like that. Well, what I love is that you like to talk to PhDs about their research and mm -hmm. you like to apply it. 
I mean, to you, that's one of those languages that you learned how to walk through the door and shake hands and be on the other side and chat with them about what they're doing and what they care about. Yeah, I'm intrinsically interested in those types of things, and that's why I chose to work at, in the university environment. Um, in your question at the beginning about being a jock, I wouldn't describe myself as that. And I, I think that a lot of sort of intellectually curious athletes wouldn't describe themselves as that as well. But I think it's sometimes it's it takes the you know some faculty by surprise that uh, the, about the level of intellectual curiosity that exists in the student athlete population. And that's one thing that we're really trying to um, squash is this notion of you're either you know a jock or you're a, a nerd, right? You can be both. So my very favorite UCD story, I guess this is my time to tell my stories. My favorite UCD athletic story is the year that we had three starters on the football team that got accepted to med school. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's a UCD story. Now, it doesn't happen very often, that level of achievement. But graduating on time, following through on things, those those are the things that matter. Yeah, and I think that th th that type of thing, um, maybe not specifically med school, but that type of academic achievement has been consistent here for a long time. And I, I think people should not be surprised by it anymore. And not, not only is it here, it's not at the majority of, of Division I programs, but it is in many Division I programs, more than I think people here really understand. Um, you know, I, I use the example when I talk to faculty of Princeton. Princeton at the FCS level in Division One is FCS. The, yeah, so the football championship subdivision. Good. Which is, you know, you have the big schools that play in football bowl games, and then you have Division One schools that don't play in football bowl games, but they still have Division One football. And that distinction isn't really just about football; it's about sort of the overall economic model of the athletic department. But the uh, Princeton is the best athletics program in the country at the FCS level. Of all the Division I FCS programs, Princeton is the best. And uh, by, by the Director's Cup ranking uh, that, that, that comes out every year, ranking the overall athletics program achievement for the year. So, you know, it's not, and, and really the, the number one school on the Director's Cup ranking for 23 years in a row for all of Division I has been Stanford. Uh, 22 or 23 years, I, I, I can't remember the exact number. But nonetheless, th those are two examples of I institutions where their student athletes achieve academically at a very high level. And the results also show that the, the institutions achieve athletically at a very high level. And I just think that uh, it's important for our community to understand that we will always maintain our, our commitment to academics and we will continue to get better competitively, but that doesn't, you know, improving competitively does not preclude uh, maintaining a really robust commitment to high-level academics. To believe that these two things are mutually exclusive is just factually untrue. It's also biologically untrue. Pe people that are good athletes have a, a great capacity to learn and yeah. to benefit from their experience. Yeah, I think that. That, that, that's, I mean, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. I think that culturally is the issue that I think sometimes in college athletics where it goes wrong is, is it's a cultural issue where there's a belief um, that prevails in the culture of athletes having, being treated differently and being, being treated in, in ways that don't, aren't well, conducive Well, they're celebrities. Yeah. So, and, and, and that's not the best developmental opportunity for, for those athletes as young people. And the, the fact is there are plenty of environments, I've just named a few, where their athletes are really good athletes and they're really good students, and the institution has success in both athletics and academics. And, you know, Davis aspires to maintain and strengthen our academic performance, but also really make a lot of strides on the competitive side as well. So I'm just going to rattle off a, a half a dozen names here. Um, and these are just examples. Most of them stayed in sports, but um, I'm fairly old, and these are older people, so they've had their whole lives. The first one is Bruce Gallaudet, the mm -hmm. sports editor of the Davis Enterprise. 
when he was 17, he lived in Covina, and the Covina paper didn't cover the high school football sports, and he was a cornerback on the defense of, the, of his high school football team. He went down to the editor and said, you should be covering high school sports. He said, we don't have anybody to do it, and Bruce said, I'll do it. And he loves his job every yeah. day. I mean, nobody enjoys going to work more than Bruce does. So he, He's been great, too. He covers us extensively. He, uh, he is a great ambassador for sports in this community, and we're, we're happy that he covers us. So with that, let's segue to everything you want to do with the future of UCD. I mean, it's a big question. The, uh, the way that I, that I think about it is I try to break down the entirety of athletics into areas where uh, we can try to distinguish ourselves from from our competitors, and you know that's when you think about it from a strategic standpoint. The college athletics is about creating differentiation uh, against your competitors and creating areas of strength that can can distinguish you, and then also covering up any areas of weakness that you might have relative to your competitors. So if you think about those things, you know for for UC Davis, our academic reputation is is a strength at the moment. Uh, there are some weaknesses that we need to uh, address. I think facilities is one area where we can continue making progress. Uh, there, there are a few facilities that are, are somewhat left over from previous eras and we're working right now on projects to, to be able to, uh, on fundraising opportunities to be able to improve those. Um, the same goes for just our, our overall business operation can can improve and become modernized a little bit to help us generate more operating revenue, which will help fund our operating budgets of our, of our teams at a higher level. So those are some things that we're working on. I think where we have the biggest opportunity to distinguish ourselves and do so on a national level is in, um, it's in a category that we call student athlete outcomes. And that's you know what we're referring to is uh, not only academics, but also things like postgraduate opportunities and jobs and grad school placements for, for student athletes and the ability to leverage the alumni network and you know, leverage the participation in sports for the de development of character and, and packaging up these things in, in a really highly professional manner and, and making sure that we have a, you know, we're building the nation's best infrastructure for producing great student athlete outcomes. And we have a lot of good things in place now. I just think we need to refine it. I think we need to be able to, you know, create a compelling recruiting brand around it. And and I and I expect that that'll lead to some differentiation for us, which is good. You know, we want, um, in addition to to focus a focus on student athlete outcomes being the right thing for our students, and align with the values of our institution. It, it also can lead to some recruiting upside when we're able to create a really outstanding opportunity for young people to come and get a great education and end up with a fantastic job or grad school opportunity afterwards. So you have a game plan. You have six points. You want to talk about each of them. Yeah, well, we, you know, I, I think um, one of the things that I've found early in my tenure here is that there hasn't been a clear definition of success at the university in recent times for athletics. So if, if somebody said, hey, UC Davis, how would you consider, uh, what would you consider success in athletics? And there, there hasn't been a really great answer to that question, uh, at least that I can tell. Well, there's the Causeway Classic on Saturday. That's one, one yeah, winning that game is very important. <laughs> but, um, so what I've tried to do is I, I you know, I've, I've tried to uh, evolve that discussion so that we do have a definition of what success looks like, and, and it comes down to six things for us, and I'll go through each of them. The, the first is, you know, we will consider ourselves successful if our student athletes are being educated in an exemplary fashion, and that means not only academic uh, outcomes that are equivalent to the student body, but also, as I mentioned earlier, career opportunities and personal growth that our student athletes experience while they're here. Um, a second sort of measure of success for us is the degree to which our athletics program enriches the undergraduate experience for all students at Davis. And this is an area where we're going to continue to focus on um, because the sports are a really great opportunity for our student body to socialize, uh, to, to celebrate, you know, 
being together, being with friends, watching friends compete, having fun in a sort of a communal setting. It's traditionally what people think of as being a college student. Yeah, and it's and it's and these days it's not really even about the sport per se. It's about the social time, right? right. And you know, so we're, we'll continue to refine how we interact with our student body and 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 how we create value. Um, for our students in terms of enriching their experience. So that, that would be, uh, accomplishing that would, would be considered for us a measure of success. Uh, the third is that we really want to enhance the academic enterprise, not just coexist alongside of it. And what I mean by that is we, you know, we, athletics is, a, is a, an interesting laboratory uh, for collaboration on, on research. Um, what, you know, in my previous stop at Stanford, we uh, worked with, in athletics, we worked with the School of Medicine and some of the neurologists there on a concussion study that involved the football players wearing accelerometers in their mouth guards. So these types of collaborations can really enrich in the, uh, the academic enterprise that is occurring at our university. And that's what we aspire to do in athletics is really add value there. A fourth measure or criteria of success for us is is being competitively successful uh, in competition, which unlocks additional opportunities for alumni and donor relations. So when we're winning and, and, and there's a lot of people that are involved in being around our events and, and enjoying uh, the opportunity to connect with each other, that, that's a broader platform for the entire university when it comes to alumni and donor relations. So we, we will consider us, ourselves successful once, you know, if we can, accom if we can accomplish that. Uh, fifth is, we, you know, we, we also know that um, the university at large can, uh, can benefit from much more earned media exposure when athletics is, is performing at a high level. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of examples uh, out there in higher education about the, the, the impact, the positive impact of an athletics program being competitively successful, driving additional uh, uh, branding and earned media opportunities. So we're focused on that too. I, I just want to insert an example of that, which is when Magic Johnson became a freshman at Michigan State, they added another thousand students to the student body that year. Yeah, and, and that's, those kind of examples are, are um, they're relatively common. I mean, you, you, this, the growth at a place like the University of Oregon has correlated with their with how football much? success over the last 10 years. And, yeah, yeah. You, you know, the same is true for a place like Boise State in football and in basketball, a place like Gonzaga. Uh, so just to name a few West Coast examples, it's a, it's a very... Um, it's a very uh, evident and, and pronounced impact of, of high-level athletic success on the, on the sort of notoriety and, and branding of a university. So that's what we hope to accomplish that as well. And our sixth kind of indicator of success is that, as I mentioned this earlier, but we want Davis to be an external-facing example for young people uh, in our state about how to be a student athlete and the fact that trying hard and we want our, our student athletes to be evidence that trying hard in sports and in school is is not only possible but it's it's cool and it's the right thing to do so we want people from all backgrounds to see our student athletes who also come from all different backgrounds and you know identify with them you know I, I look like her I'm from a neighborhood that she's from and you know she's a great you know basketball player volleyball player and I'm a 12-year-old, and I like basketball and volleyball, and I like school, too. And I wasn't sure if trying hard in school is cool, but she does, so I will also, right? And whether those people decide to come to Davis or not, it's not really, you know, that, that's not really a specific concern of ours. We just want people to understand what it's like uh, to, to see student-athletes who operate at a high level in both academics and athletics and emulate them. And this is important for, you know, youth coaches to understand. It's important for parents to understand. Uh, like I said earlier, it's a, there's a lot of people in this country that play school, uh, play sports, and go to school at uh, at the at high school and below ages. And the more examples they have of people that do it in a way where they're paying attention to both and doing well at both, that's better for everybody. So that's what we're committed to. Unfortunately, in professional sports, it's the you know, first off, they get paid a lot of money, but secondly, when they do something stupid, then it gets a lot of exposure. Right. 
when they do something good, it doesn't. Yeah, I part, think that's part a, of that's I think human that's nature and the nature of general. media. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you can do nine things right and one thing wrong, and people remember the wrong thing. Correct. The um, so long term, where where do you see UCD athletics being five years from now? Well, I you know I think we we have a few things we're trying to set out to accomplish. One of them is we would like to contend uh, with Princeton and some of the other. Um, very successful FCS level athletic departments and see if we can get up in, in, our, in the Director's Cup standings to the overall top 50, and, uh, which would put us in contention to be one of the top FCS level programs in Division I. And so that, that's, that's a competitive goal of ours. We, you know, we, we want to continue graduating our student athletes at a rate that is um, equivalent to the overall undergraduate student body. We want to continue the academic performance in term, measured by GPAs. So those are two things that are sort of traditional outcomes that we feel are really important. We, uh, we also think that there's some pr more progressive, forward-thinking uh, accomplishments that we would like to, to, to meet or to make and set an example for others in college athletics, and one of them being making sure that we're uh, stewarding and educating our student athletes from all backgrounds, including underrepresented minority backgrounds and socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds, in a really elite, nation leading way. I think just being progressive in that um, area is really important. And it's, you know, having that philosophy is commensurate with the university's belief in, in committing to first generation college students. And that's, that's, we share that in athletics as well. We, um, you know, there's a, there's a number of different outcomes around percentages, percentage of our seniors that we know are placed in jobs or grad school by, uh, by graduation day. Like that's a really important outcome for us. We'd like to be able to demonstrate that we're enhancing the character, you know, whether it's emotional intelligence or grit of our student athletes as they go through school as well. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that there's, in five years it's tangible that we've we're adding value to the academic enterprise, uh, and not just coexisting alongside it. So, it's we, we're, we're gonna we, we plan to be comprehensive in, in how we improve, and you know that means competitive success, and that also means continuing to operate in a more progressive, integrated fashion with the university. Well, you know I think you've said some really wonderful things, and I think we're at the end of the interview. Do you have anything else you want to no, say? No, I appreciate you having me on. No, it's my yeah. pleasure. Absolutely. I want to thank you for being on our show. Thank you. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Excellent. This is what's going on. Thanks for watching. Good evening.